Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to another Florida Bar CLE uh, hosted by Rocket Matter. And in this case, we have a very special guest that I'll introduce shortly. My name is Lisa Pancini, and I am the creative manager here at Rocket Matter. And I have the pleasure of introducing Rick Duman, who is the vice president of sales for SecNap Network Security. So let me tell you that when we have questions about network security, cybersecurity, telecommunications, it's always great to go directly to the source. And Rick has decades of experience in this field. So we are really happy to have him here today to host today's CLE, cybersecurity, um, demystifying cybersecurity for law firms. Now, before we do anything, what I would like to do is uh, do some housekeeping. This webinar CLE is being recorded. And if you happen to sneeze, get a snack, go to the restroom during the presentation, don't worry, you will receive a recording of the webinar tomorrow along with the slides. And there will be a Q&A session towards the end as long as we have some time. But if you look on the right-hand side of your screen, you should have a little GoToWebinar control panel. And what I would like somebody, anybody, a brave soul, uh, there should be a question section. I would like somebody to please type in, let me know if you could see the screen, if you could hear us okay. Um, you'll be able to send a question. So if anybody, if you can let me know if you can see the screen. Brave soul here, Roger, thank you. All good, okay, perfect. Thank you guys so much, I really appreciate it. So without further ado, I'm gonna let Rick Duman take it away. Rick, thank you so much for being here today. Uh, thank you, and uh, thank you for having uh, SecNap on to present on cybersecurity for your for your group. Uh, so I'll, uh, I'll just get right to it. And a little housekeeping uh, of my own advance here. So, so first, we're going to cover the the learning objectives. So, what are we, uh, what are you hoping to cover over the next uh, over the next few minutes? Um, a little highlight on on the cybersecurity landscape. What does the what does the landscape itself look like? Why are law firms being targeted? Are they being targeted? Uh, more importantly, why should they care? Uh, and then finally, what can law firms do to protect their practice? So, so we're going to go over uh, a checklist of sorts, a, a sequence that um, that they can look at uh, to to better protect their law firms and their and their clients' data. So, what, when we get into into cybersecurity, when we get into you know, common topics, you've you've heard it in the press, the the, the number of breaches that have been out there. You, you you've heard the terms, I'm, I'm sure, ransomware at some point. Uh, one one fact that uh, that remains is the cost of the breach and and questions that come why uh, what makes what makes breaches so expensive and it's an important factor to realize it's not just the breach itself but the aftermath of the breach so the data forensics the notification the business reputation uh, all the factors that impact that business in an aftermath of just an incident or, or a full on data breach so and one of the answers is it's well they've always been expensive. So the the cost of breaches have been have been expensive and they are becoming more expensive, uh, not just the aftermath but the consequences because there's more regulation coming into coming into play. You have if you've heard of uh, the, the GDPR affecting uh, EU states, there's also new privacy laws uh, coming into the United States. You have the California Protection Act, uh, some new laws in in New York and, and other states that are following suit to to protect privacy. So Unfortunately, the cost of a breach is not going to change. It's going to go up, uh, both from the, the protection side and the aftermath. Some of the terminology that's that's common in cybersecurity um, is is the alert volume, and it's it's a it's a term uh, referred to uh, in security practices. What exactly uh, is an alert volume, or, or is an alert rather? With with most electronic devices today, from your desktops to your laptops to servers. Uh, all devices today generate some form of logs. And those logs, again, your IoT devices, your nests. Uh, if you have a, a, a proper security practice, you should be reviewing those logs. And many do, and, and unfortunately, many don't. Unfortunately, with the, the landscape today, uh, there's a tidal wave of, of, of alert uh, of alerts coming through, which is making it very difficult to manage uh, security on a day-to-day -day practice because uh, because the hackers are taking different forms and they're they're getting in, so so the ongoing monitoring of of those alerts uh, it has become a challenge. Uh, one of the things that holds true 
across all all practices, and there's there's a number of of frameworks that go into this, is is on that on that last topic, which which is a multi layer approach, and and we're going to get into that uh, into that later in this presentation, and, and what exactly is a multi layer, um, like a safety net. Uh, the the fact is, at one point or another, uh, a measure a technology will fail. Somebody, a hacker, will somehow get into your network, and this is why you need other layers of, of protection, just like you would uh, layers to keep you warm uh, if you're in the uh, in the northeastern states, and um, and you need to to stay warm. So with security, you, you need you need additional layers of protection to blanket your your environment, protect your data, or to to better alert you. So one of the first things that we look at when uh, when we get into the mind of a hacker, and, and this is important, I think, for most most businesses to understand, is that the, the hackers do follow some sort of a playbook, and, and this is represented in a number of ways. Uh, one of them called is referred to as the kill chain, and what you see here is also the unified kill chain. And what this represents, uh, depending on what that that uh, the hacker's objectives are, whether it's ransomware. Crypto jacking and data theft, which which we'll get into, they follow this they follow this pattern, and you'll see between this slide and the next slide, uh, again the landscape and, and what and what makes it important. Uh, what they typically do is is you've got you've got the social engineering aspect, you have phishing, and they have the cycle where they they want to get their initial foothold. This is this is how they first uh, enter your network and have what's called an advanced persistent threat. Uh, and then they move laterally within your network so that they can access other systems and, and, and seek the data. And then finally, the exfiltration, right? So they, they will take different steps and use different methods uh, to achieve their goal, depending on what their objective is. And what's really important in the industry today is there's actually statistics regarding how how quickly they can achieve a certain step. And we'll, we'll get into that in that in this next slide. So what you're looking at here are statistics that come out of a, uh, a breach report. So you see uh, Verizon Data Breach Investigations Report. So Verizon and, and a number of other organizations actually collaborate on an annual basis to uh, to record the, the breaches that were identified and, and were made aware to identify these important statistics, which industries um, have been impacted by certain types of hacks, uh, as well as the different cycles, the different steps that the hacker has taken in, and how quickly are they able to, to get to the data, and, and how long are they before they've been discovered. And one of the things that I want to present here for, for those on the, uh, on the call is this discovery. This is a very, very important statistic, and this was represented in, in, the, um, in the Equifax breach, which, which many of us are, are, are or should be aware of and many of us have, have also been affected by. And that is the discovery. So when we go through the stage, there's the initial attack uh, that the hacker used to, to compromise and then and then get into, um, get into and start removing data. And then finally, how quickly were they discovered? Well, in, in, Equifax's, uh, in Equifax's case, uh, it took 78 days to be identified. And, and part of the reason was lack of uh, sufficient monitoring. Uh, they had some monitoring, but, uh, um, but it, they had let it expire, and, and this actually came out of the U.S. Senate report back in March. And I'm going to go use this slide and back into the, to the other one. So we look at this this data exfiltration. So this is them getting to your data, and as you can see, it takes from the compromise to data exfiltration literally minutes, and that's that's from getting in and and pulling data out. Well, if we go back to this slide, that's all the way at the end. So what is that? What is that telling us? And this is something that that many of us know. When uh, when the NSA tools were leaked, the Eternal Blue, uh, if you've seen that in, in the news, um, the industry itself has become become more sophisticated and more automated. So they're able to use these tools, use these methods that have already been written, to to gain to gain access into your environment and to to achieve whatever that objective is. That objective again may be to extract your data or to drop ransomware. Now, it's important to realize it only takes it only takes minutes for them to to get in, yet the discovery takes 60 to 70 percent, 60 to 70 percent of the recorded breaches actually took uh, months um, to realize. So they've had they've had months of gaining access uh, of your data before they're even discovered. This is very important, especially for small businesses. 
because small businesses typically do not have the level of monitoring that an echo uh, that an Equifax would have even had to have been able to detect it. So in many cases, most industries they don't even know what um, uh, they don't. They don't even know that they've been attacked. And this this also occurred a, a recent breach uh, at the LabCorp Quest on the healthcare side, um, and was was recently breached as well. So you may have seen that in the news. And finally, how how does this affect the legal community? Well, all of these breaches are requiring additional due diligence as they inspect their vendors to ensure that their vendors are not that path in. So Target, as a breach years ago access to the target's point of sale system was actually achieved through their air conditioning to their HVAC vendor who had systems in. So we're going to we're going to take a pause real quick and we're going to go to a uh, to a quick poll uh, and this poll will be used for um, for some of the next corresponding slides that are specific to legal and uh, we'll jump right there, right into that if that's uh, if that's okay. All right, you mind uh, showing the uh, the next one please? All right, so as we uh, as we look at these results here, which uh, typical to the last time we've done it, uh, uh, decent distribution as far as solos and, and attorneys, um, and and why why am I why am I asking this? So I'll, I'll advance to the uh, to the next slide here. So I mentioned earlier the the Verizon breach report. So the Verizon breach report typically follows a number of of, of industries from healthcare, from financial to manufacturing. Uh, legal is not typically uh, in, in that report itself as its own industry. Um, and, and some of that is due to, to, to breach mandates, mandates and notification. But the ABA tech report that was put out in 2018, if you haven't seen it, uh, has actually been tracking this uh, for a number of years for the legal space itself, as far as, as breaches, right? So, in, 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 the left, in the left graph, you'll see that trend going up. And this, this represents so that you have 15% uh, and then bumping up to 22 and 23%. The question that was asked there uh, was the number of firms that have experienced uh, a security breach and via, via a number of forms. And so you can, as you can see in the legal space, uh, that trend is up. And that trend is up across all, all industries, but significantly for legal. And then they, they have that, that same question. They did a distribution based on the number of, of, of firms. So the, no, the majority of the attendees here seem to be falling in the, in the solo and the, the two to four, uh, 49. Um, and, it's, and it's important to understand that specifically because of the tools. So um, the hackers are going after, after some of the, 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 larger, um, the larger firms, but it's not necessarily direct. A lot of this is, is again, it's an automated approach. The, 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 hacker, the hackers actually have an industry uh, of their own that has automated a number of these that they can schedule ransomware. And this, this was actually uh, presented in a, in, a, um, in a segment from 60 Minutes not too long ago, a few weeks ago actually, uh, regarding ransomware affecting certain industries. And this is also a very important statistic to realize for uh, you practitioners that are in, in solo or, um, or in the smaller firms, specifically, do you even know whether you've been breached? Um, one one new piece that's, that actually just came up uh, a few days ago. Uh, if you Google Blue Keep, so there many smaller firms may have some sort of an IT consultant that's an ad hoc. It may not, you know, you may, may be too small to have a dedicated IT uh, IT staff. How do they access your systems? Well, they usually use your log me ins, your Team Viewer, a lot or terminal services, and a lot of those solutions use what's called RDP. A remote desktop protocol. It so happens that there's a vulnerability that's been that's been known about, it, and the NSA uh, and Microsoft have been trying to inform. There's still over 900,000 known uh, users out there that that have not patched that vulnerability. So again, many of you may have been breached, and you and you you still don't even know. So we're going to be going next into a bit of that the checklist into uh, into some of the things that. Um, even the even the smaller firms can can look into to better protect uh, to better better protect your firm. Uh, and if you would like to download that, we do have this checklist available. Simply just go to uh, www.secnap.com uh, forward slash legal, and and there are a few ideas. And if you have questions on that, we'd be certainly happy to uh, to help answer it. So so going so in, going into that checklist and uh, and some of the and some of the frameworks. 
so as, as I mentioned, and, and, and you, may, you may or may not have heard of them, there, there are a number of, of frameworks that have been established to, to wrap their arms around cybersecurity as, as a challenge and, and a number of things that you can do. And as I mentioned earlier, having a multi-layered strategy will, will typically help lower your risk. Um, and there are no shortages of opinions. Now, what we've seen from, from most of these frameworks, and it could be from CIS, uh, in the credit card industry, PCI, HIPAA, ISO, they all follow some of this, some of the same uh, same rules. They all have a lot of overlap as far as things that they feel that you, you should be required, and and some of them have they go into a little bit more detail. And, but they all can agree there's there is no silver bullet uh, that's going to solve everything. There's no single solution that's the the perfect fix, and that's what makes this a, a challenge for everybody. And and what many many of these many of these frameworks uh, out there have is a sort of an adoptive model based on, uh, on, the, on the companies because you can't set a standard rule and require uh, every company to use the same exact uh, technology or companies as far as their, their cyber defense. So they, they all follow a similar process. This one is modeled off of uh, the Gartner's uh, adaptive security architecture and that's to do some, some pre-attack planning to predict as, as an industry what, what your challenges might be. Uh, to deploy technologies to help prevent attacks in the first place, uh, but also a method to be able to monitor and to detect when a hacker has gotten through your systems. And finally, um, if you've been, uh, if you, you've had an attack, you've had a breach, if you've had ransomware, uh, what to do retrospectively uh, to have an incident response plan uh, and to learn from that so that the cycle does not continue and you, you wouldn't have to do it again. Hopefully. So the next the next stage of the um, the next the next stage of the of the list would be a vulnerability management program. And again, almost all frameworks are going to reference a, a vulnerability management pro program in, in one in one form or another. And what exactly what exactly is a vulnerability management program? Uh, when you look at cybersecurity. As, as a whole, it's not about technology uh, as, as, a, as a solution. It's actually a mix of, and they, they mentioned this, a mix of the people, the process, and the technology, and how they work together to, to, to resolve or to identify, uh, to fix the challenge. So a vulnerability management program should look holistically uh, at the business to, to identify to identify things that you can look at it. And common common areas, uh, that almost every framework refers to are, are a sort of security assessment, looking at it from the external. So how how can hackers see your network? What gaps do they do you have um, internally? What what are they able to do internally? So I mentioned earlier the um, the blue keep the vulnerability on RDP. So Windows 7 um, is, is is especially vulnerable to that or the older operating systems. Um, so they need to be patched. What most companies do, especially those of you on this call that may be running a, a smaller practice, is do, is your IT guy actually looking at this on a regular basis to, to patch your systems? Because there's sort of a philosophy where my systems are behind a firewall, so I'm protected. Well, that's not that's that's both good and bad. Uh, in many cases, when a hacker is able to get inside your network, if you have not been managing your, your software vulnerabilities and patching accordingly, they have free access to, to get to and do whatever they need to do. And that's been the biggest challenge, and that's why in some cases with our security operations center, we see uh, we see attempts that, that take minutes to, uh, to go ahead and, and get in. So it, it, can, it can move very, very quickly. Um, it, uh, going back to the ABA Tech report, one statistic that uh, that I typically reference. Uh, from that report itself, only 28% of the law firms that report that reported on that survey mentioned that they, they even had a, uh, a a full assessment done. And again, that full assessment is not merely about the technology, but also goes into the people and process. And what I mean by that is, is for example, security awareness. Uh, have you or have your has your business done security awareness training. As a check the box, many, many companies might look at a presentation such as this, right? So you look at a presentation once a year, but is that, are you following up with phishing exercises? For some self-reflection on this call, you know, think to yourself, how, how good are you at identifying 
a, a, a phished email. Uh, they can get pretty, they can get pretty, um, pretty scary, right? So they look, they look very real, especially if a hacker has, has, has triggered an email uh, specifically for you. If they've done their, their homework and they've leveraged social engineering, they may be looking at your LinkedIn. They may be looking at your Facebook uh, and really tailor a, an email direct to you. Some of that's called spear phishing because they're really going after, after something specific. So it's really good to have an awareness program um, to, improve, uh, to improve yourself on being able to identify um, you know, we all know that the, we're not getting a million dollars from a Nigerian prince anytime soon. Uh, they're they're much more sophisticated these days. Finally, and, and 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 why we're pointing this out, with most law firms today, the the biggest feedback I get from a number of firms that we speak to is that their largest client is asking about this vulnerability management program. So what what have you if if you on this call if you're practicing commercial law if you're representing whether it be healthcare or um, or finance or, or any entity uh, they have rules that they typically have to follow from a from a framework so if they're if you're if it's credit card right so PCI has a framework that requires some of this so your largest client right now might be asking you what is your what is your vulnerability management program what is your security process and they're asking for written proof. Uh, that that a vulnerability management program exists and that you're and that you're following it because they have an obligation to keep their data secure as well and that's and that's a trend that's that seems to be very uh, prominent right now in the uh, in the legal space so some additional self reflection questions that uh, that you might consider um, three of them and th these are typically questions that we see on on some of the uh, from from some of our clients that get this from from their their clients so a law, again, law firms might get these questions from, from their, their largest clients. And those were, you know, are they doing vulnerability scanning? Are they doing penetration testing? Well, what is that? You know, are they hiring a third party to, to look at their systems to ensure that they've been patched? If you have Windows 7 and you haven't updated it recently, then chances are you have an, a current vulnerability right now that the NSA and the government is saying you need to patch because this can very well be the next WannaCry. It's very, it's very similar. If you if you remember the WannaCry ransomware that occurred years ago, they had enough notice, and a lot of companies were impacted because they didn't take action. So so clients are asking this uh, front and center right now. So do you have a security awareness program? What is it? Is it is it just that presentation once a year, or is it is there a follow up? And finally, uh, an incident response plan. So that that question is is common. Um, details on your incident response plan. Um, you know, and they're asking this because if you if you're representing a client in a week or so, and you get and you suffer ransomware, and you lose your data, how are you going to represent your client in court without having access? So these are really important questions that that typically come up uh, that we see from from a number of uh, of clients. So we're going to go to the next poll question. If you can go ahead and push that. So Lisa, if you don't mind, we'll go ahead and close the uh, the poll. And we'll run through that. So the question, as you, as you saw, was, you know, does your company perform vulnerability scanning and, and penetration testing annually uh, on internal IT systems and applications? Now, wh why is it, first off, why is it important to do this on a regular basis? Um, if you guys would just for a moment think of your own cell phones, how often do, you, do your cell phones update this? Do you get an update for whether it's an iPhone or an Android? And th the answer is, well, often. And, and the reason for that is new vulnerabilities are discovered on a regular basis. And the same goes with Windows, the same goes with, with any, any system today. So it's important to do it on a regular basis, whatever, whatever that, that regularity dictates by, by the business. So as, as far as the answers go, um, which, which is important for this audience, right? So have you done it? Yes, no, not sure, right? So 45% saying no and 37% and not being not sure. What well, chances are the uh, if if you don't know, then chances are it's probably a no, um, and that's that's a very um, that is part of the challenge with cybersecurity. Again, if you haven't identified your vulnerabilities and patched them, that in many cases for the hacker that's like leaving your front door unlocked. Um, so that those are those are things that that many many industries should should look at um, as as a general rule. Um, 
you know, they, they say um, you don't necessarily need to be the fastest. You don't need to outrun a shark or outswim a shark. You just need to swim faster than the guy next to you. And that's in, in cybersecurity that, that definitely plays a part here. So if you if you're better protected than the guy next to you from an automated perspective, you're 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 going to be a bit more secure. So the next the next step uh, again, and it goes back to that uh, chart is uh, to prepare for a, a breach and, and print a plan. Uh, a number of um, a number of times we've gotten involved with um, with an incident response for clients that have uh, undergone a, a ransomware attack, and in many cases they never had a plan. Um, in a few cases that we've seen, uh, they had a plan, but in the case of ransomware, it was digital and the file was encrypted itself. So in effect, they had no plan. So what, one of the things that we typically recommend is, is is when you have a plan, if you haven't if you haven't looked at it for years, you you might want to review it. Uh, here in Florida, you know, we we deal with hurricanes on a regular basis, and most businesses are going to look at what their evacuation plans are from a um, from a hurricane perspective. Uh, keep in mind, as it relates to cybersecurity, ransomware, or breaches, um, you can follow the same sort of methodology. Just keep in mind that with ransomware or or, or data breach in general, you're not going to get the same notification you want a hurricane. So it's important to know that, that so that you can review that on a regular basis to make sure your contact information is the same. You know, some of the things that you want to look at is your, your cyber liability policy. Uh, you want to look at your backups. You want to make sure that your backups are, are performing properly and that they are segmented. So, so as you, if you've got a, if you, if you have your laptop attached to a USB device and um, you use that as your personal backup, um, again, remember if, if that laptop itself is encrypted uh, and drop if they drop a worm on it chances are they may, may very well affect the attached storage so you want to keep that seg segmented and, and separated uh, to to ensure that your, your backup itself is uh, is is, main, is maintained properly one other statistic that that we bring up which again applies to, to those on this call <clears throat> 43 percent so so 43 percent of cyber attacks are on small businesses and it goes back to that philosophy in cybersecurity today with the landscape. A lot of this stuff is automated. And, you know, if you're Bank of America, if you're Chase, if you're a municipality, yes, a lot of it is, is targeted. Um, but a, a lot of what's reported is, you know, is, is stuff that, that potentially could have been resolved if, if some, some proper sci cyber hygiene was put in place. Or at least it would make it more difficult uh, on, the, on the hackers. So, ne so next on our... Um, on our list here is, is the the cybersecurity awareness, and we're, we're going to go we're going to go through that in a in a little bit, um, and and then referring back to that chart. So many of the many of these uh, the technologies represented on this list you you may have heard before, you know firewalls, antivirus technology in a cybersecurity sense is always going to be your your first line of defense. Uh, that that antivirus that email security. Uh, but you have to you have to make sure that these tools are updated regularly. It's it's not necessarily a good idea to buy pirated software, just as a general rule, right? Because pirated software, you don't know what vulnerabilities exist because they may not. If it's pirated, it may not update. So you you want to keep a good tab of the software that you have. You're definitely going to want going to want to um, you know for your business specifically, you want to you know make sure that yeah. Uh, that it's updated on a regular basis, uh, with the with the the idea and the mindset that at one point or another, you know, in the case of antivirus, uh, so many versions of antivirus, there's there's no perfect antivirus that's going to catch everything, um, and that's why there's so many different different um, antivirus companies and software out there, um, and there's another a, n a number of other ways to to protect it. So you can always assume. You got to have this in place, but you have to have a second line. So, in the case of email, and this goes back to cyber you know, cyber awareness. Um, if you look at if you look at this uh, this email, this was a, a test a test phishing uh, campaign that we ran. Um, if a number of you are using a Gmail as an example, uh, you may have seen this notification before from from Gmail. Um, self reflection: Ask yourself uh, if this was directed to you. A new sign-in from from Chrome. Uh, would you have fallen for it? This was, in fact, the test phishing email. Uh, again, the the whole idea of an email from FedEx or from a Nigerian prince um, 
those still go out, but they're not as uh, but they're not as effective as some of the new templates that some of these guys are using. And uh, and for for the larger firms, uh, one of the things to to look at to 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 have this culture of awareness is to make sure that it starts at the top. Uh, a number of businesses that we've spoken to, um, unfortunately, in some cases, you know, at the very top, uh, senior leadership, um, they don't really recognize the problem. They look at their they look at their network or they look at the business, and they they know if their phones are working or if they're not working. But what makes it challenging for cybersecurity is you again you don't know if you've been breached. Um, so once you get the buy-in from the very from the very top, um, it's very important to help uh, ensure that the right the right policies are, are are in place and the right investments are made in technology and that it's and it's adaptive and it changes from year to year and, it, and it's reviewed because you know what what you invest in this year at some point you know you're going to you may need to upgrade or update it because the, the landscape the landscape the landscape is changing uh, and if you haven't done it you know phishing or, or cyber threat exercises so they, they there are a number of uh, security awareness programs that also involve phishing exercises and, and what these phishing exercises are uh, are they, they're phishing emails that get through that that get sent to, to see for your employees if they would have if they would have fallen for it um, that way you can come back and, and, and leverage uh, leverage some education. So we're gonna we're gonna take a look at where we're at so far and in, in, in this in this playbook. Um, on the top left, as I as I pointed out in, in the predictive side, a number of things, you know, vulnerability assessments, uh, a, a number of technologies that you can look at. You know, your cyber liability insurance. Obviously, this is something that you need to look at before an attack. Um, very little chance of purchasing hurricane insurance uh, after the, the hurricane has passed. Same with cyber cyber liability insurance. You, you definitely want to get that in place uh, as early as possible. And if you do have it, you're going to want to review it to make sure that your policy covers today's threats. Uh, on the on the defense side, uh, for uh, for protecting yourselves, keeping in mind it's it's multi layer with email security or antivirus. You should you should follow that up with cyber awareness training so that you can identify um, some of this. Another 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 factor that is very important that um, many of many of you may be familiar with is that last end on the right multi-factor authentication. So what is multi-factor authentication? Uh, if you're logging into your banks uh, today, um, you some people find it annoying, but it's actually very effective. Um, Today, the most common method of gaining access to your data is your username and a password. Well, with multi-factor, you need another secondary authentication method, which is typically a text, to ensure you are who you say you are. Very effective way of, of, protecting, uh, of perfect, protecting your environment. Most common right now in banking, you see that we all, we all use that uh, in many ways to, to log into, um, at least on the initial login, to log into the, um, uh, to our accounts. So I had mentioned early in the present presentation about about alerts, about alerts and uh, and alert fatigue. Uh, this this affects those businesses that have uh, that are actually monitoring. And I, and I mentioned earlier that the, the the deluge of of alerts is is pretty prominent these days, depending on the size of your organization. Uh, just to put some 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 numbers for you, uh, a, an environment with about a hundred devices will generate approximately one gigabyte of logs, of security logs in a day. Uh, and these are small files, these are small alerts. And typically that is, that is, that is more logs than, uh, than, than any, any entity can cost effectively monitor and react to. So a lot of, a lot of software, a lot of uh, artificial intelligence as they, been, as they call it, is being used to, to find behavior analytics, to look at that, to see, is there something going on? Um, so when you look at at, at any framework uh, or any uh, any security posture, even for legal, you're going to want to look at things within your own environment to find well, what is what's going to be the most effective solution for your business. Um, one interesting factor in, in cybersecurity uh, that you point out is, is this industry right now has a negative unemployment. And, and what I mean by that is there's more jobs than there are capable engineers of, of actually filling those jobs. So that's where a lot of artificial intelligence is coming in. But that's also the nature of the industry itself. These logs, uh, the cybersecurity uh, situation has definitely grown in the last few years. 
So some self-reflection questions to ask yourself, to ask yourself or the MSP that you might be using or the that outsourced IT guy, depending on depending on your business, is is are you are you monitoring it? And and, and why, again, why is this important? When you go back to that Verizon Bruce report, keep in mind, look back at Equifax. Equifax had a number of systems in, and it still took them 70 plus days to realize that someone was in the network. Look, self-reflect in your own environment to to think is that is it possible that someone has access to your data? I've, I've been highlighting and focusing a lot on frameworks. Uh, and I, I, the NIST framework, there's again several ones that we mentioned. And, and one area that a lot of them don't really go into in full detail is the dark web. And I know that there was discussions at some point going going a bit further into this, but dark web, you, you've seen this and you've seen a lot of a lot of press uh, about it as well. Uh, both on a consumer side as well as what many don't realize on the um, on the commercial side. So what what exactly what exactly is the dark web if you if you haven't heard of it? Well, going going back many years ago, uh, the dark web was essentially a an anonymized network that was established for the Navy. Uh, it used this, uh, a service called Tor, uh, which refers to the Onion Router, which is a number of layers and what it allowed for was it allowed allowed for anonymity in communication from the embassies and, and throughout that network now what they did was they opened it up to commercial use so that anybody could access it, access it and the reason for that was well if you have a, an anonymous network that only the the navy is going to use well it's not really anonymous is it so they, they incorporated that and and a lot of the intentions originally were were, were good intention and and part of this and anonymity allows for, you know, for human rights. So in many cases, journalists in, in certain areas, um, are, they're fearful for what they're reporting and, and, and wanting to get this. So they want to be able to communicate anonymously. Um, unfortunately, the, 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 on the flip side of that, this system has been used for a number of nefarious reasons for, uh, for, for, for criminal activity, not, not just for cybercrime, uh, but for things like the arms trade, the drug trade, human trafficking. Um, so it's definitely a, a scary, dangerous place. Um, I know a, a, to as much as as much as possible, uh, a number of organizations are are monitoring it uh, as much as they can be, and that monitoring ha has the ability of, of actually extracting some of the data that they've, they've been able to find, such as the, the cyber crime, such as as passwords. So in, in in any breach, when an entity is to take the data, and in some cases. If I use LinkedIn as an example, if you use LinkedIn a number of years ago, LinkedIn itself was breached and a number of a high number of user accounts and passwords were actually made available. If you're not aware of this and you've been using LinkedIn for a number of years and you, if you haven't changed your password, it's probably about time that you did, that you do change your password uh, because those credentials, those passwords are being are being sold online and through marketplaces and in many cases, um, breaking in based on stolen credentials, it's it's a high it's it's a high profile. It's a, a number of of, of breaches. Um, they're actually getting in by using uh, using these credentials. So as a matter of fact, 81 uh, percent. So 80 percent of hacking related breaches typically leveraged uh, stolen and or weak passwords. So the point that I'm trying to to illustrate on on the dark website for for commercial is there there are solutions out there. To monitor your 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 business profile online, and um, and look for uh, for stolen stolen passwords, it gives you a a warning to to go ahead and make those changes. Um, but also in, in a number of business uh, meetings that I've had, the awareness that this stuff is out there in some cases for for senior leadership, they were not aware of it, and um, it, it helps um, when they realize that their their actual passwords, and they're actually able to see the evidence of that. It's uh, it's pretty telling. So one of the things that we're making available to uh, to those on, on register on this call, uh, we can do a search for you. So if you have an interest at some point uh, to look at your 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 corporate uh, domain to see if uh, if there's anything made available online, we can certainly do that for you. Um, Secnap.com forward slash dark web. So we're we're coming towards the uh, towards the end of this, and I'm going to get back to this sort of playbook. Right. So the top left on the predictive side. Just to recap, a number of things that, um, as a business, you should look into if you have not, to to better your security posture. A number of 
Then on the top right, uh, defense mechanisms, whether it be firewall, email security, to to uh, to protect your um, your environment. And at the bottom right, for for those that uh, that can do it, the no a number of detection solutions. Uh, I mentioned here um, IDS IPS. I haven't gotten to that into this presentation. That stands for Intrusion Detection Intrusion Prevention System. Uh, that is a bit um, a, a bit what we focus on here at SecNap in terms of identifying um, a, an attempted breach and actually stopping it. So there's a number a number of monitoring tools that some companies can look at. And then the next piece, uh, cyber liability. I, I mentioned it early. Uh, this is something that should be done um, early in your in your assessment. And um, with cyber liability, a you should definitely get that. Uh, but but more importantly, it should be reviewed. Um, if it's a if it's a policy that's years out, you want to make sure that your cyber liability policy is going to cover you for threats that are today's threats. So, for example, we we've seen some policies with some of our clients that did not cover cloud. Well, so if the breach occurred on cloud resources, the insurance policy did not pay out, or if it was done via social or via phishing. So there there are as in any any insurance policy there there's always going to be some gaps or some exceptions so you want to review that policy um reasonably to, to make sure that it's that it's, it's that it's adequate for uh for your business so on, on the on the last piece if you haven't done so um there are a number of uh, of uh professional cyber consultants that can can go through some of this and, and help you formalize a plan um, so a couple of things that uh, that we typically look at would be um, obviously to talk to your IT uh, IT to, uh, provider. Take this this checklist that we had for example. If 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 you see some some areas that you're unsure about, uh, it would probably be a good time to to take that that checklist and and review it with your IT team. Specifically things like the vulnerability management program. Um, find out if you if you are using Windows 7 or an older if you're using Windows XP. God forbid, you know, you you want to look at that because those are uh, those are the most vulnerable. A lot of systems have been written to to quickly breach and access that, so that happens very quickly. So you're going to want to review that with your IT team or provider, or if you don't have one, uh, with uh, the consultant or uh, security consultant, and uh, and to go into into that for your business, uh, understanding that every business is different. So uh, you should have something that's that's customized specifically to your to your budget or to to your what we call the a risk appetite. So uh, so finally wrapping things up um, and a little about about SecNap and 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 why we're why, why we're talking. Uh, so SecNap we we were established in 2001. Uh, we are Florida based originally as a research and development company in security, and our initial work was patented. So we were patented uh, IDS IPS platform and um, and regarding regarding secnap uh, so our patent was received in 2009 uh, and then we rolled that into a uh, security as a service uh, platform which we we operate today under the name cloud jacket and then finally in uh, in closing this out uh, back to that playbook right so your your four different phases to review the the before the during the monitoring and finally the reaction and, and that reaction is is that incident response plan that hopefully uh, you've put into play and you've, you have written. And um, and I think Lisa, I think we're going to be wrapping this thing up. And uh, I think we'll go to the next one and maybe we'll take uh, take some questions if there's time. All right, awesome, guys. You can always write uh, a question if you have one in the GoToWebinar control panel. So if you do have any questions for Rick, uh, go ahead and type those in. We'll be reading them out loud and answering them for you here in the webinar. Okay, Rick, we had this question pop up. What do you recommend for a firm that keeps all of their documents in the cloud? So what, one of the, the common challenges for cloud um, is not just on the breach side, but the configuration side. So there's a lot of, for, for the cloud itself, what are your settings? So how are you sharing it? Um, a lot of the, the reported breach activity in that space, there was a marketing firm, I can't remember the name, that was actually based out of Florida, that had millions of records that were identified as a breach. And it wasn't that necessarily that a hacker went specifically and, and accessed it. It was that in their settings, they forgot to encrypt it, and 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 it was made publicly available. So if you're using the cloud, 
what you're doing is you're, you know, you're, you really want to, it's like jumping out of a plane without a player, without a parachute. So you want to, you want to make sure you're using encryption. You want to make sure depending on, so, so with cloud, there are a lot of architects that, I mean, it's configuration by click of a mouse in the, in the old days, you know, a lot of this was custom programmed, uh, you know, Cisco, there was a lot of specific uh, skill sets with cloud. Sometimes, you know, anybody can, can, can make, make something available and, and accessible and just because it's working doesn't necessarily mean it's secure. And that's what makes this a challenge. So you definitely want, if you're using the cloud, you want to definitely ensure that you are encrypting your data at rest so that in the event, the public cloud was breached. And if they did access your data, it's, it's not as, as useful because it is encrypted. Okay. Here's another question for you, Rick. What are the most common vulnerabilities? The most common vulnerabilities. That's a, that's a loaded question. Um, <laughs> So, you know, there's there's a the referral to an OWASP uh, top 10. Um, it, de it depends on the application. So a lot of web forms, for example, have things like cross cross site scripting. Um, most of the most common vulnerabilities are actually identified via a, a standard uh, vulnerability scan. Um, a lot of the vulnerabilities right now, and it's also application based. So so Windows. Uh, or, or any any system is going to have a number of vulnerabilities that come up, um, and a lot of times it's 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 like a buffer overflow or or, or some miscoded in, uh, area that that allows a hacker to take advantage and then um, and then run their own software to to sort of escalate privileges or, or to move around. But um, you can look at the, if you look at something called OWASP O W A S P top ten, that typically covers um, a lot of the the most common vulnerabilities that, that are looked at in, in, um, in, in most applications. Okay, um, here's another question. Are there systems to test potential and new hires? Uh, for example, a test to present the new, to the new prospective hire during the interview introduction process to test to what extent they increase your vulnerability. Hmm, interesting. Oh, that's a, um, you might wanna look at their Facebook. Right. So most. So, you know, what what are they putting on? That's that 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 probably covers other areas just <laughs> beyond cybersecurity. Um, but for but you you did bring up a new point, a, a point that I, I probably overlooked in my presentation on security awareness. So um, you, you would probably want to look at their social profile to see how how talkative they are, because what they put online is is stuff from a social engineering perspective that can be used at some point to come back. You might be able to, to password guess based on their favorite team or, or whatever. Um, but on that new hire, and I think equally as important, if you bring them on, um, security awareness should start on that new hire's day one, right? So one of the challenges that some companies have is they've been around for 10, 15 years, and they have employees that ha have been accustomed to doing things a certain way. You know, they have a, a sheet and they share passwords and they do they do certain things um, and it's hard for them to adopt a better security posture because, you know, it's like teaching an old dog new tricks. So so more important than, than, than looking at them before they hire, it's on day one. You want to you want to get them tested. You might want to start off with a phishing exercise, you know, within that first week to see if they fall for it. Um, hmm. That's that's one of the things that I probably recommend. Okay, here's an interesting one. So if cloud storage has vulnerabilities, am I better served by having a central server or I'm assuming a local server? So I guess you're talking about uh, pre a premise-based server versus a cloud server. Uh, it's it's a debate. There, there, are, there are some um, advantages on cloud, such as scalability. Um, some folks look at cloud. You can actually, if you manage it properly, you can turn it off, on or off. There's, there, there's no right or wrong, which makes it cybersecurity so personalized as to whether you do a prem versus uh, versus a cloud uh, a cloud provider. Uh, what you what you really want to do is you want you want to make sure that um, that you're patching and that you're updating the system. Uh, the biggest challenge with the cloud is it's not your system, right? It's somebody else's system. So and I, and I remember what I had this conversation a few weeks ago. So if you're trusting a service, if you're trusting a service provider to house your applications, to house your data, if they're not doing proper proper due diligence, if they're not backing up your data, 
um, you lose you lose control of that. So, you know, if, if you if you if you keep it on prem, make sure that you're doing the updates. If that's supposed to be in, in incorporated in a service provider's offering, you need to make sure that they're doing that. But you might want to keep for the data. You might want to keep a a separate set. And then lastly, you want to encrypt that data. Any of the data at rest, you want to try to go ahead and have that encrypted in case a breach did occur. Okay. Here's actually, here's like a two for one. So we've actually had a few people ask similar questions. So regarding uh, RDP, remote desktop, is keeping Windows updated enough or are there additional steps recommended? For example, encryption and specifically VPNs. So can you talk a little bit about uh, remote desktop and, and also VPNs? So re remote de remote desktop protocol or RDP is is a, is a proprietary protocol from Windows, which they use to operate what what you call terminal services. Um, and RDP in general, the, the philosophy is is you know I use one system to have a GUI interface of of somebody else. So this you know RDP whether it's terminal services, whether it's uh, I mentioned the earlier event viewer, log me in. Um, a lot of companies have some sort of a system in where their their remote IT guy can come in and fix their problem. And it's that external access coming in that can create a problem, right? So you're you're you've op what you've done is you have your your firewall, you have some system in place that is supposed to keep people out, but you're you're putting a little pinhole in it and you get you're you're creating a method for someone on the outside to get in. So it needs to be secured and you might be you, you might want to use you might not you might not want to keep it on you might want to have multi-factor authentication um to the other question about windows updates you definitely want to make sure that uh, that your your systems are are definitely updated uh but keep in mind uh windows xp is end of life and and windows 7 is, is soon to follow so so to the question on on windows updates well if you're in a, if you're using software that's end of life, it's showing that it's updated only because they're not patching anymore, which makes, for example, Windows XP especially vulnerable. And what about uh, using VPNs? How does that in, how should that be incorporated, if at all, into your cybersecurity plan? Well, certainly the so in VPNs you know, again it does it does encrypt uh, um, encrypt the data. Uh, v, a VPN is is definitely a secure access. A number of businesses use that. Um, what many companies are falling victim to is not is not necessarily that uh, that hack on a VPN or, or terminal. It's 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 sometimes it's it goes back to the passwords. So if you have Event Viewer or, or Team Viewer rather, um, or if you have a VPN, that only does that only works if you're protecting. The, you know how do you know on that VPN that the user is logging? I mean if, if they're stolen credentials. Um, someone still might be able to get in. So there's no there's no silver bullet. If you're going to use VPN, you might want to tie that in with, you know, multi-factor authentication um, as a, another method to validate them in, in gaining access to your network. Okay. Um, let's see. What do you think about the security of Dropbox? Um, going back to the cloud example, um, you definitely want to encrypt your data as much as possible. Um, all of the all the cloud platforms, OneDrive, Dropbox, um, you know, you're, you're putting you're putting your data you're putting data on the cloud. Um, it's it's a matter of personal preference. If it's sensitive data and if you're worried about someone accessing it, then it, then you know it's 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 definitely a consideration because uh, most of those environments at one at one time or another have had an issue. So um, you know, it's not going anywhere. I mean, cloud is clouds. Cloud's not leaving. It's gonna. There's only going to be more cloud adoption. Uh, so, going back to the, the the original stance, which is the encrypting your data. That's from a security perspective. That's that's definitely. If you're if you're going to use Dropbox, that definitely go ahead and encrypt it. Um, but one other consideration, and we look at this from our perspective for for business as far as uh, as far as the business policy. So on our intrusion detection um, system that that we have. Dropbox, OneDrive, or any of those, um, Google Drive, um, in many cases, it's a business policy whether they should allow it or not. And, and specifically for, for things such as an, uh, an insider, I didn't even touch it on the, present, on the presentation, but what about internal actors? Right? So if you're in a large firm and you have sensitive information, um, 
majority of hacks are 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 perpetrated by by outside actors, but there's a metric in for for internal actors as well. So insider trading or or stealing and you know selling and what happens? Think about this: What if if you're in court and you've got sensitive information? Do you necessarily want the other side to have? I mean, in some cases it's mandatory that they do, um, but there are policies in place that don't allow for Dropbox because of that internal threat. Hmm. And then one last question. Am I paranoid to think that using more security programs and teams increases vulnerability? My logic is that this increases access points. It depends on how it's managed. So um, a, lot of, a lot of companies today buy the next greatest thing and going to cloud. If it's, if it's not configured properly or if it's not being monitored, you can create more problems for yourself. Um, it depends on, again, it depends on, on, on your industry. And I think one of the things I, I think we brought this on the last call was LastPass, right? So the, the systems that, you know, I have 50 million passwords that I need to protect. And, and that's, I think that's prominent in what this question I'm thinking that they're asking is great. I have, t I have 10 different systems. Now I have 10 different passwords. So it, it can, it can be, if it's, it's, if it's unmanageable, then yes, you can be creating more of a problem yourself. So the, the, I think the answer to that is simply to to identify for your for your business, you know, what's the right policy for yourself, and and how to manage that. Because to 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 that question's answer, yes, it can create a problem if you're not managing it properly, if you're not monitoring it properly. So you need to put something that's sustainable. So that, and the the last piece on it, I mentioned like vulnerability management, scanning, penetration testing. Um, how frequently should you do it? If you know you're not going to be able to patch a system, but every six months, does it make sense to check it every month? You, know, you have to you have to do something that 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 works for your business, that makes it repeatable. Otherwise, what ends up happening is it's it's nothing's going to get done. Same with passwords. People changing them so often, sometimes people create simple passwords so they don't forget it, and that again creates a problem. Awesome. Well, Rick, thank you so much. I just want to reiterate before we leave today, uh, your Florida Bar CLE course number is on the top right-hand corner of the screen. It is course number 3543. So this course was approved for one hour of general CLE credits, including one hour of technology credits. Um, Rick, any, finding, in a, any parting words today? Oh yeah, there's an exit poll, isn't it? <laughs> yes. Uh, so when you, when the webinar is it's okay when the webinar is over, uh, you will be asked whether or not you would like a free consultation for um, for SecNAP to do, uh, you know, some complimentary research on you. I think uh, Rick, you could uh, elaborate more on that. <laughs> I think you have it on the on the screen there. So as I mentioned, if you haven't done it, if you're interested in a, in doing a dark web search, we can certainly do that. Uh, the checklist is available, or if you've got questions, uh, we'd certainly make ourselves available. I know this is, uh, I guess, predominantly in Florida, uh, I'm guessing because of the CLE, uh, and we are we are a Florida-based organization as well. So I'm um, happy to talk to you. If uh, if we can be of any help, we, we'd certainly like to, uh, to take that call and help you where we can. All right, awesome. And don't forget to submit your credits on the Florida Bar website. There should be a section for continuing legal education, and there will be a link on the page for you to um, put in your credits for today. And again, take a look at your email tomorrow afternoon. You'll receive the slides, the course information, and also a recording of today's webinar. So thank you all again for joining us and have a great day.